Hi, this is Martin Harris. Listen to Fascination Street Podcast. Will you say it in German? Yes, Martin Harris. And uh, that's his uh, Fascination Street Podcast. Do it in Russian. It's a Martin Harris. This is uh, the uh, Fascination Street Podcast. I believe that everybody has a story. And I'm fascinated to hear them. So come with me as we take a walk down Fascination Street. Welcome back, Streetwalkers. This episode is with Andrea Ozvart, actress and career coach for professional performers. Andrea is a Hungarian-born actress who had success in Germany, Italy, and America before moving back to Hungary and starting her coaching career. She coaches professional performers of all types, and she helps them succeed in entertainment through conscious choices and managing their resources effectively. In this episode, we talk about her early years growing up in Hungary and what led to her successes in different venues, such as modeling, commercials, television, and film. And then we talked about the transition into becoming a coach and why she did it. This need to help others stemmed from a very popular blog that she had created that was focused on helping victims of emotional and mental abuse in relationships. That's a very fascinating conversation. And then, of course, we talk about her new series. It's called The Therapy. It's on Amazon. I believe it's in German, but you guys can look for it. Maybe it's a dubbed or something, I'm sure. This is a very informative episode talking about what makes people tick. And this is my conversation with actress and career coach, Andrea Osvart. Welcome to Fascination Street Podcast, Andrea Osvart. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? I am fantastic. Thank you for asking. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Andrea Osvart. She is an actress and career coach for professional performers. She has a slogan that I'm really attracted to. How you do anything is how you do everything. First, tell me where that came from. That's really cool. Well, I don't even remember, but thank you so much. I've heard it years ago somewhere and it kept spinning in my mind. So I internalized it and I always remind myself of it as well. So I thought maybe it would be just about time to share it with others too. Well, I think that is great and I might steal that. (laughs) (laughs) Feel free. (laughs) Andrea, I'd like to start with where people were kind of born and raised and how they grew up and it helps us understand how they got to where they are. So where were you born and raised? Where'd you grow up? I was born in Hungary, in Budapest, and raised in the countryside. So I would say I grew up in the so-called communist era in the Eastern Bloc, where and when everything was kind of restricted and gray. I don't know if your listeners can have an idea about it. But as far as I remember, I was nearly 10 years old when the Berlin Wall fell. So I just remember scarcity and that everything was quite gray around us. Actually gray, like people were wearing gray clothes and buildings were gray and cars were gray, or it was just not a good time. I remember the buildings were gray. Like, I don't remember a lot of colorful things. And the idea of the whole communism was being no different from others and just to fit in. Why today in capitalism, everyone's goal is to stand out. So it was the total opposite back then. So you grew up in Budapest? Uh, No, I grew up in the countryside and I moved. I moved to Budapest when I was about 20, when I started university. Okay, got you. Everybody says Budapest, but you said Budapest. Which one's right? I've never been there, so I got to go with you on this one. Uh, I use both for simplicity and whatever comes to my mind. But in Hungary, Hungarians say Budapest. What is the name of the village where you actually did grow up? It's called Tomasi. Okay, cool. (laughs) 
so here's here's what I'm picturing, and you tell me if I'm wrong. I'm picturing that little small countryside village where Belle from Beauty and the Beast grew up. Is that about right? Mm, I don't know. No, not sure. We were not that rich. <laughs> 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 what did your parents do for a living? What was their jobs? Oh, my parents were divorced, got divorced when I was four. My mom is a speech therapist for kids and my dad is a vet, you know, animal doctor. Oh, an animal. Okay. So is your mom's a speech therapist back in Hungary? Yes. How does she say Budapest? <laughs> oh my God, you're asking funny questions. Yeah, actually... Maybe I got from her my love for languages and literature and the Hungarian language. I think she would say Budapest. Ooh, nice. You said your love of language. Am I correct in understanding that you speak multiple languages, like a, a lot of them even? Yes, you may hear I do speak English. What? <laughs> yeah. And I also uh, majored in Italian language and literature in a Hungarian university. And after that, I lived in Italy for about 10 years as well. So my Italian is also fluent. That makes three languages. And I have, you know, mid-level knowledge of German. Nice. I would imagine those things help you get jobs. Yes. And that's a very, very good point to talk about because... Yeah, I don't know which episode of yours I've listened to, but um, a director was talking about him trying to be an actor before, but he didn't want to be a, a starving actor. And also, I think I would have been a starving actress if I didn't speak all these languages, because speaking multiple languages and acting in a foreign language just helped me to have multiple markets and divide myself in between different markets. When I was out of work in on one market, I just took off and visited another market. And there that's where I was, again, a newbie, you know, interesting. And people also love accents, in my opinion, even though it's quite a debate for actors. But I think having uh, multiple markets is one of the keys to build a successful international career. I agree. Let's talk about your successful international career. Just some of it. We're not going to cover all of it because you have a lot of film credits and TV credits and commercial. Like you've done a whole bunch of stuff. And I don't know if anybody has that kind of time to cover your whole resume. <laughs> but I want to talk about uh, your time in Italy. Mm -hmm. What made you decide that you wanted to move there? Why? Why Italy? Well, actually, I finished uh, high school and then I finished university. And I've, I've done all these studies of Italian language, literature and arts. And after that, I thought, what do I do with it now? Do I become an Italian language teacher or what? So there were not much opportunities in Hungary back then and maybe not even today, to be honest. It's a small country. So when I was still working as a model, I was invited to do a photo shoot in Rome. That was my first visit to Rome. And after that, I got an invite from an agency. So that's how I ended up in Italy. And I remember I took off and told everyone I'm going to be away for like two months. And after a few days, actually, I found myself on the street because the agency wasn't correct and wasn't fair. So they wanted me to do something else instead of just professional work. But I was so proud and with my head held high, I, I didn't want to come back home. So I rather went to the Hungarian nuns and slept there for a few weeks until I found a decent agency and made sure I come back home with some sort of results and not just the shame of, you know, having failed or, you know, having been victim of a fraud. Do you think that there's shame in failure? Not anymore. Now that you're a little bit older and a little bit wiser? Absolutely not. But back then I felt like, you know, I was kind of bragging to my friends that I'm going to Italy and you're not going to see me for two months because an agency has just signed me up and uh, that's going to change my life. Well, 
it did <laughs> but not in every sense like not in good in a good sense so i didn't want to come back with the explanations and and trying to convince them that it was not my fault but you stayed there for 10 years mm -hmm. so you must have found some success somewhere you know in the beginning i know that you were the host of a television program for a while tell me about that what was that program and what was the concept of the show yeah, I can say that the first five years I spent going to acting school, looking up casting calls, agencies and networking events and all I could do to enter the in industry. And after five years, I got my big opportunity and I was host of this very big, already 70 plus year old Italian uh, music contest, a singing contest that it's called Sanremo. Sanremo Music Festival. That's a national, big national music festival that's go going live on television for five days, still today, every year. Back then, there were like 20 million people watching it from all over the world live. And I was one of the hosts in 2008. What did that do for your career? I would imagine that you're getting noticed on the street and recognized and that kind of thing if so many people are watching you every day. But other than that, what did it do for your career? Well, that's what happened, actually. And I was sort of prepared for it because people told me how important this program is for Italians. And uh, and it happened. So all the paparazzi uh, phenomenon I've experienced for a few years after that. And of course, my name and face became known and probably still is because of my short hair and foreign accent. You know, I kind of stand out in Italy being blonde and tall and speaking Italian. So people do remember me. But on the other hand, that was quite a commercial mainstream thing. And it didn't fulfill me as far as my artistic concerns were or my artistic uh, desires. So I've kind of wanted more. And after a few years, I felt like I was repeatedly cast for television programs and television series. And I wanted to do feature films as an actor. So after 10 years in Italy, and a heartbreak, of course, broke up with my boyfriend. I decided when I was about 30 years old that now or never. And then I went to L.A. and I moved to L.A. for three years. You were very successful as a model. You were very successful in TV commercials and things like that. What made you decide to become an actress? Why was modeling not where you stopped? I think I've always wanted to be an actress ever since I was a little child. Modeling was just a tool, a way to get to it. And modeling is not at all creative. Everybody else around you is creative. The photographer, the makeup artist, the stylist, the hairdresser can be creative, except you who just stand there mute and do what they say. So after eight years, I felt a bit bored and I was fed up with it. And I felt this internal need of wanting to express myself and want to communicate with people and reach people and connect with people. So I've spent all my salaries, all my money that I've made with modeling on acting schools and workshops and trainings. Do you think that those schools and workshops and trainings were beneficial? Do you think they were necessary? In a certain way, yes, because that's how I gain my confidence. Not because anybody ever asked about if I have a certificate or if I have a diploma in acting or if I have did this or that training. No, of course, they kind of look okay on your resume. But to be honest, it's not the material that they teach that would enrich you if you go to an acting school but it's the self-confidence that you know that you have done it that you know what they teach in an acting school and you know that others are not better than you that gives you the confidence that you can use when you walk into a casting or auditioning room i heard you once say that you thought it might be easier in Europe to get discovered 
Do you still feel that way? Mm, yes. Europe is smaller. Um, yeah, the pool is smaller. So I think also European movies kind of started to do more co-productions among themselves. So I am actually part of a so-called European talent network, which is a group of agencies. So I think I can have enough exposure, but not too much competition like I would have in America. So that being said, why did you decide to move to America for those three years? Were you running away from that boy or did you, were you running to another boy? I was running away from that boy, but I was also still very ambitious and I wanted to prove my worth to everyone and myself. And I knew that I was not less than other American actors. And I was still eager to find out how the system works in America. And I attended some acting schools, workshops, you know, trainings there. And I felt like I'm completely able to stand on my feet in America as well. I have interviewed a lot of actors and actresses who started and had pretty decent sized careers in other countries and then came to America. And every single one of them basically said they kind of had to start over once they got here because I guess all of their success in their previous country didn't really matter to American agents and casting directors. Did you have that similar experience? Did you basically have to start over? Just partly, because in Italy, I was so successful, to be honest. And in Europe, I've had so many nice credits, like I worked with Robert Redford, Brad Pitt, Clive Owen, Heath Ledger, all in movies that were shot in Europe, that I had all these things on my resume and in my showreel. And that sort of made a difference. I think that people would already take me more seriously. But I'm not saying I didn't have to go on castings, not at all. I still had to do all the castings and sit on the casting floors and submit my material everywhere. But I didn't mind. I didn't go there with the idea that I, I was a star and I had to, you know, and people had to hire me straight away. I think because I'm a Hungarian, I always knew that I still have to do the hard work. So I did. And it took me another year and a half to book my first job in Los Angeles. Is the casting experience different in other countries than it is in America or in Los Angeles for you? Was your experience different? Oh, yeah. How was it different? We can't really generalize, but, you know, Hollywood and L.A. is the biggest uh, movie hub. So everything is more professional. And when you drive into Century City, it's like a little village already which you don't see in Hungary or Italy at all. The system here is more like family style. People know each other more on a personal level. Maybe we can even uh, know each other's phone numbers or contact each other's directly. This is something probably unheard of in America. Like everything goes through the agency and the agent, you know, you have to sign in at the reception and get a badge and you, you know, have very professionally scheduled appointments. Here in Europe, everything is still a little bit more traditional, I would say, like you sign in on paper. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> you said that... You feel like because you grew up in Hungary that you don't expect things to be handed to you and that you know you have to work harder. Do you think that's just part of the culture and the way you were raised and the, the culture of the Hungarian people? Or what do you attribute that to? We are a small country and there is nothing that can change that. And therefore, we always had to fight more. And, you know, even with our language, we were forced to uh, learn other languages, second languages, not like you who were born a native English. And, you know, that's the world language. So everybody learns your language, not the other way around. So I always thought that I had to, and I get to use my disadvantages to, and turn them into advantages. So this is me now today, because I was born in Hungary in a small country. Today, I speak four languages 
I've built quite decent career, I would say, and I still got to America and I've had my run there and I experienced Veni Vidi Vici, you know, as in Latin goes, I went, I've seen and I've done it. Hey, streetwalkers, here's a word from our sponsors. Let's get back into it. Why did you leave America? After three years, I started to uh, notice some mood swings, to be honest, in myself. And I realized I didn't really belong there. I felt homesick. I missed my friends, family. And even the movies that I went for castings were not of my taste uh, most of the times. I'm more into independent style and European style movies And I'm very happy that I've done these American productions. They are still making my resume and my rank. They build it higher, but I'm happier in Europe. Nice. I don't know if you know, but you're not the first Hungarian actress that I've had on the show. Mm -hmm. Come on. You come on. A uh, Hungarian-American actress named Lily Bourdon. Oh, my God. I know, Lily. Yes, of course. Oh, we've you do? Worked, we've worked together when we started, like, 20 years ago. Yes. We were sort of friends, you know. We support each other when we can. Nice. So that means that mm-hmm. you were both child actresses, because there's no way that... <laughs> There's no way you you two are older than 20. So I I think that's really cool. That is a small country that you know each other. I've only ever Mm -hmm. talked to one other person from Hungary and y'all know each other. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) Oh, I have a question for you, which would be weird if I didn't, because that's what we're doing here. (laughs) How important do you think it is to maintain a balance between your work life and your real life? Wow. Yeah, we're getting to the point because that was the main reason why I started to coach actors and performers, because me, myself, I went through some difficult times, especially during the pandemic. I was out of work for one and a half years, which never happened before in 20 plus years. You know, I really gave some deep thoughts about what happens to performers when they can't perform. And I've read some books about performer psychology and artist psychology. And uh, I started to write articles and uh, blogging about it. And people started to read it. And this is how I started to support actors and trying to balance my own life as well better ever since. And today I can say I'm able to balance, but before I was too much into my professional life, like really emerged and sucked in this industry like completely, entirely, and that was not very healthy. And then I've read the stats that substance abuse and suicide ideation and suicide attempts are 10 times higher among entertainment industry workers and performers than among general population. So I started to understand the the whys of my own mood swings and me being on edge and grumpy most of the times. And so I started to do my own therapy and to heal myself. And I hope I can help also other actors and performers who are going through transitioning times or who are considering to quit. Maybe sometimes that happened to me as well, that I have developed and I have some nice ways and tools and methods to survive those ups and downs. I think living in Los Angeles for three years will make anybody grumpy and want to kill themselves. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right? Yeah, we just don't talk about it enough. <laughs> just real quick, I want to talk about your time during the pandemic. Where were you when the pandemic hit? Like, what country were you in during the COVID pandemic? I was in Budapest in Hungary, but I was supposed to shoot two German movies back to back, and all the flights were canceled. And the borders got closed. So I was really stressed because, of course, I didn't want to lose my jobs. But I could contemporarily, I was also on Dancing with the Stars on Hungarian television. So I needed to do all three at the same time in different countries and crossing borders every week. And of course, when somebody wants something really bad, 
then you pull it off. I really wanted it so bad to pull it off. So I did, but it was not easy. So you did both of those movies and you did the Hungarian Dancing with the Stars? Yes, I've shot both German movies back to back and I finished Dancing with the Stars as well. Wow. It was crazy. Like I had to use a friend's car to go to Germany because the flights were canceled. So I drove probably 10,000 miles in September 2020 because every other day I had to be in in Germany and then come back to Budapest and two days later be in Germany again. And, and that's when I decided to, you know, buy a new car for myself. I was going to ask, are you still friends with that person who said, yeah, you can borrow my car and then you put 10,000 miles on it? <laughs> I am, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so tell me about Dancing with the Stars in Hungary. This is going to show you how I'm an ugly American. I didn't know that they were doing that show outside of the United States. Yes, we were doing season one in 2020. So you were on the first season of the Hungarian? I was. Check you out. Yeah. I've only ever had one other person from Dancing with the Stars, and that was um, Carol Baskin from the Tiger King series. Wow. So what was your experience like? How much did you like doing that? You know, I told you about growing up in the Hungarian countryside when we didn't have opportunities to do anything really. So I didn't have a chance to attend ballet school or dance school when I was little. So I kind of kept a promise to myself because I really wanted to make it up for myself as an adult. So finally, opportunity came. And I was cast in Dancing with the Stars. So I lived my childhood dream of dancing on the floor and all those beautiful dances with a professional dancer partner. It really was a dream come true. And I'm so glad because I've made new friends there among the dancers. And that helped me also in another way to have a better quality of life here in Hungary. You know, we were just talking about balance and having friends and friendships is so important in this business. Is that show still going on, The Hungarian Dancing with the Stars? I think, yes. I think they're on season three or season four now. That's fantastic. Would it be a spoiler for you to tell us where you ended up? Where'd you finish? Yeah, well, no, no, I think it's public. Out of 10 episodes, I did seven. So wow. I came quite far. Good job. Do you still <laughs> remember any of that dancing? Because a lot of the people say that they forget everything they learned a year later. I hope I do. At least I can recognize the dances, which is already a big result, because before that, I couldn't even tell them apart. And yes, I'm braver and more courageous when I'm dancing. And although I'm not very active on my YouTube channel, but if you um, look me up on my YouTube, I think I posted one or two snippets of my dances that I'm very proud of. Were you scared when they said, hey, do you want to do Dancing with the Stars? Did you get a little fear going? And then you were like, absolutely, because I'm scared, I'm going to do it. I was very scared and it was a high stake for me because I'm very competitive and I didn't want to lose, but I wanted to win. And actually for an extra dance, they called me back for season two. And that's when I realized that dancing for me in season two was much, much easier because there were no stakes anymore in it. I was not in a competition. I was not a contestant and there were no high stakes. So I didn't need this to be liked by the audience. And that set me free somehow from my own expectations. And actually my dance on season two, which was a cha-cha-cha, got the maximum of score. So it was a nice comeback. Good job. <laughs> Thank Very you. Very impressive. You're welcome. Now I want to talk about your coaching. You help others succeed in entertainment through conscious choices and managing their resources effectively. What does that mean? Well, first of all, why did you decide that you wanted to get into coaching? Why the need to help other people realize their dreams? Anonymously, I've been helping people already for seven years through my Hungarian blog. Actually, that became so popular that I thought maybe people are not just interested in me because of my looks and my fame, but also for my thoughts. And also a lot of actors came 
for advice because I've had such prolific or thriving career and success. So I started to ask them questions and realized that a lot of artists just love the artistry and they don't want to do the business side at all. And there are some some of my own principles that you can actually download for free from my coaching website, which is andreaosvar.coach. I have a free ebook in which I pointed out 10 principles that I've been living up to, amongst which, for example, the higher purpose, to set yourself a higher purpose, for example, that can help you through difficult times, but also make you to have better coping mechanisms. That's the better word for this business. When repeated rejections happen, like you don't get a job or you don't succeed at a casting or a callback, I've developed these ideas and hacking my own brain sort of with these techniques and exercises to not only to survive, but to see the positive side and the bright side and the way I call it, the collateral gain of those little failures. You know, we talked about failures and failure is not uh, something to be ashamed of. But these things I actually realized quite late as a mature person. And through these exercises, I'm trying to educate actors and performers to be more resilient and to be more themselves and give them energy to thrive in entertainment industry. So the principles and the ideals that you teach through your courses and your books and your um, your newsletter, and uh, you, you do, I think, one-on-one sort mm-hmm. of a, a coaching thing, um, these are things that you have learned through your experiences, not so much things that somebody else taught you. These are things that you learned no. and acquired and developed from your own personal experiences? Exactly. I've developed this method because no acting schools teach these things, unfortunately. Basically, this is the school of life and are my personal techniques and uh, systems and methods and sheets that I have done for myself and that now I'm sharing with other actors for their benefit. You said that when you first started your blog, which I think you said you did for like seven years or something anonymously. Why did you decide to do it anonymously? Well, my first Hungarian blog was not about the entertainment industry. It was not for actors, but it was for a very specific niche, a target audience about narcissistic abuse. Who was that target audience? Victims of emotional abuse. I know it's huge here, but is that a big thing in Hungary? It's huge. I mean, seven years ago, I was the first one to translate articles from English and con the technical terms of this particular phenomenon, because not even the Hungarian psychology or psychiatrical books were enough information of the modern knowledge, like, you know, Sam Vaknin or all these kind of authors and bloggers who've been active already for such long years were not yet translated into Hungarian literature. So I've learned about this phenomenon all in English online. I thought, oh my gosh, even Hungarian people must have access to this information. And I have to be sort of a pioneer to, you know, and voluntarily be the medium. And through me, they can educate themselves You know, I have this sort of helper syndrome. So I've been helping this group of people. I've had a Facebook group for about a thousand people. And my page, my blog is still alive, although I'm not blogging anymore in that theme, but it's still live and it's still read by a lot of people. The timeline suggests that this might have been a a direct result of your breakup in Italy. No. Oh, good. No, no, actually, that that was a quite normal heartbreak. And I had another experience years later with a sociopathic person. Well, I am sorry for that experience for you. Thank you. 
that could not have been easy. I, I think it's really awesome that you were able to use that pain and turn it into a way to help others. I think that's really, really, really sweet. Mm. So the, that blog started in that vein. You also have a blog that is the coaching and the other stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Why did you decide to start a blog doing that? And why not a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm going to do a podcast as well. But I think writing is so therapeutic. I mean, it helped me a lot doing that Hungarian blog. I wrote it out. So I think I'm healed from that experience. And Writing down all these ideas about the entertainment industry and acting and actors and artists also helps me to uh, summarize my thoughts better instead of just doing interviews. I find it also useful for my own selfish reasons to do self-therapy. And it also helps others to find it because, of course, with Google... You know, they put a keyword in a Google search, like I'm feeling down or I'm out of work or how, how can I find work as an actor? So by written content, it's easier to be found than with audio content, I guess. That makes sense. It's specifically one of the things that you talk about with your clients is how to to succeed by managing their resources effectively? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. It means that we're all different. By knowing ourselves, we get to learn our weaknesses and our other skills that we have. There is this third assessment when I kind of ask you a lot of questions and learn how and who you really are. And that we start from there. So I don't want to change you. And you don't want to change either, but we are trying to find the best tools available to complement your existing skills and to add uh, more value to your existing skills and strengthen your existing skills without changing completely who you are. So is one of the steps to help me even figure out what my skills are? Exactly. Well, check you out. La -de -da. Love it. <laughs> Real quick, I do want to talk about you have an upcoming Amazon series. I think it's called The Therapy that's going to come out early 2023, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you for asking about it. Sorry for the crazy turn in direction there. I just wanted to make sure I covered that. Tell me about it. I thought first you were referring to the book that just came out on Amazon. Oh, we're going to get there in a second. Yeah, okay. So I've done this amazing TV series or um, Amazon Prime series in Germany last year, which is called The Therapy. And hopefully it gets released by March or April 2023. And it's based on a bestseller German novel that sold, I guess, 20 million copies. And you are in, there's probably 10 episodes if I know Amazon. And so you're in? Six. Uh, six of them. Good job. Mm, yeah. Yeah, six episodes. Nice. Yeah. Tell me about the book. What? So as a coach, I was asked to be part of this book series called Transforming Your Life. And it's a bestseller book series. We just came out and released volume five. And I wrote a chapter uh, with the title Mirrors and Masks. And I'm talking to actors mainly and telling uh, about my own experience uh, that I've had in Italy and LA, a little bit what we have just talked about, but in a context that I'm talking a lot about identity, self, authentic self, ego, replicated self. Like how actors get confused among all the roles, characters, identities and selves and shoes they have to fill in and fit in, which happened to me as well, and how to find a way back to oneself. And how was it that you came to be a part of this book? That they reached out to you and said, hey, lady. Yeah, I was doing this coaching uh, master training. 
And so that's how my school organized this book. And they were putting up a call for applications for participants if um, some coach wanted to participate. And that's how I got selected. And this is out now? Yes, it's now on Amazon, available on Kindle and paper version as well, called Transforming Your Life, Volume 5. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Andrea, where can people find you on social media? I am on social media, and my profiles are just basically my name, Andrea Oswald, all together. But it's quite tricky to communicate with me there because I have more than 5,000 friends on Facebook. So if people message me, it ends up in another folder that I don't get to see. And I'm not very active on Instagram lately either. So actors or performers, artists, creatives, you know, other filmmakers who want to get advice or or get coached, uh, they better book a, a free consultation appointment uh, through my website, andreasvard.coach, and uh, I offer a complimentary session to each and every one. You also offer a newsletter. Mm-hmm. Tell me about the newsletter. How often does it come out and what does it? encompass? I'm not over bombarding people with my newsletters. Maybe I would say every three weeks, I write something that I, if I discover something useful that could be helpful for others, or if I have some industry related news about my work, then I share it with my followers. Awesome. And the newsletter, of course, is free. Yes, absolutely. That is fantastic. Andrea Osvart, as we're heading out, was there anything that we didn't talk about or I didn't ask you about that you specifically wanted to talk about today? Was there anything that I missed? Thank you, Steve. I'm glad we got a chance to talk about my coaching, and I think I've covered everything and the message went through. I agree. I am so glad that we touched a little bit on your career, but I really enjoyed talking about your coaching and how you're helping others, I think that it is a very altruistic and selfless endeavor, especially the way it started with that anonymous blog on the other subject. If I was wearing a hat, I would take it off out of respect for you. I think you're doing a wonderful job. And I have really, really enjoyed speaking with you today. So, Andrea, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy day and your hectic coaching actor's schedule to sit down and let us get to know you a little bit better on Fascination Street. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. I'm really glad we spoke and that we connected. So I hope your listeners also enjoyed. Oh, 100% guaranteed that they will. And you have a great rest of your week. I super appreciate your time. Thank you, Steve. And the same to you. Thank you so much, Andrea. It was a pleasure. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Opening music is the song Magnolia from the 2001 album Intransigence, used with permission from Douglas Miles Clark. Closing music is from the song Say My Name, off the 2021 album Underdog Anthems used with permission from Jack's Hollow. If you like the show, tell a friend. Subscribe and rate and review the show on iTunes and wherever else you download podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel. All the episodes are available there as well. Check me out on Vero at Fascination Street Pod and TikTok at Fascination Street Pod. And again, thanks for listening.